Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute, let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's mm, Head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street, W-E-S-L-E-Y, -E -E number 70. We're the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK, fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions six to ten. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. Who's speaking? Hi, Margaret. It's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course. What? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message, but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh, dear. He said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. OK, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482 563379. Oh, so that's 0485? No, no, 0482 OK, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letter box. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, OK, wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right then, and don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an Arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. hear a conversation between a research student, Jeremy, and his supervisor. They are talking about the process of having a research project published in a journal. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, you're nearly ready to submit your article to an academic journal, are you? Yes, I think so. I just wanted to go over all the things I need to do before I submit it. And then, I wanted to go over the submission process with you. Great. So, firstly, you need to write an abstract. Make sure it's short and concise. Of course. I forgot all about that. And what about key words? <laughs> yes. A lot of students overlook this part and just jot down whatever comes to mind. But take some time to make a list of key words that are accurate and relevant. Okay. Another thing. Could you have a look at my article before I submit it? Absolutely. Actually, at least two senior staff members should always read through a final draft before submission. Do you mind if I give it to Professor Johnson to have a look at as well? Not at all. I'd be glad to have the feedback. Do you know which journal you want to submit to yet? Not yet. I have a short list of about three that I'm interested in. Make that decision soon, because you'll need to adjust your article so that it matches the style guide of the journal you are submitting to. I bet that can take a while. Yes, but after that you are just about ready to submit. One more thing, you'll have to sign the copyright form, just confirming that it's your own work, and then you're good to go. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, the submission process. How does it work exactly? Well, the first thing is to just send it off. You've got to send in the manuscript before anything else can happen. Sure. And then should I call to check if they have received it? No need for that, no. All you have to do is just log on to your email regularly because you will get a submission confirmation once they have processed the manuscript. And that will have comments on what they thought of it? No, no comments yet. That email is just to let you know they have received it. The next stage is what is known as peer review. This is when experts in the field review your manuscript and decide whether to accept it. Ah, they'll never accept me. I'm only a master's student. Don't worry about that, Jeremy. It's all done through a double-blind method. That means that whoever reads your manuscript has no idea whether you are a grad student or a Nobel Prize laureate. They'll only be judging your work, not you. Well, that's good to hear. And then what? once they've made their decision? Well, there are four possible outcomes. You might get an acceptance, but a first-off acceptance is very, very rare. Don't pin your hopes on it. You could also get a rejection, but these don't happen very often either. I don't think this will be a problem. What do you think I'll get? <laughs> if you're very lucky, you'll get a conditional acceptance. This means that they've accepted the article and it will be published, but you need to tweak a few things first. A sentence here, a heading there, nothing major. That sounds good. But to be honest, you will probably end up with a revise and resubmit. This means they are definitely interested, but you will need to rework the paper before it's accepted. The necessary changes will be outlined by the reviewers. Okay. So I just fix the things that need changing and present it again? Yes, but include a cover letter that discusses the changes you have made. The same goes for a conditional acceptance, actually. It helps the reviewers see that you've taken their criticism seriously. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three. But in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. 
it meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began, and it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, with students making gains that are statistically significant, and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four.